Welcome to week four on ideology. Um, I am thrilled to have you on board still. Um, before we get started, I wanted to talk about why we're even discussing ideology in this course. Um, you're probably saying at this point it's week four, we're talking about the institutions in this course. Why aren't we talking about Congress, presidency, etc.? Well, there's two reasons for that. One, is that our institutions are usually not thought of in context and with the sub-institutions as well. Um, but more importantly is that the ideology really uh, influences how our organizations, our institutions are set up and how they have changed over time. So what we'll be talking about this week is this idea that has started in our founding between smaller government that is more localized in the states or the localities and larger government that is represented in our federal system. So we talked about federalism last week and now you're going to get the ideological reasoning behind all of that. Um, and we'll see that shine through time and time again when we talk about the various institutions and how they've played out over time. So, American ideology um, has many components, and we certainly won't be covering all of those uh, this week, but I want to hit some of the highlights and then uh, talk about the ways in which these have been implemented uh, in some way, although we'll be doing that throughout the semester. So, let's take a step back and talk about what ideology is and how it influences our system. Um, so people have generally values, beliefs, and then an ideology. And they don't always recognize that they have all three of these things, but they do. Um, so values are universal guiding principles that tend to tell us um, what we value in the world, hence the term values. So some people value uh, family as their core value or friendship as their core value. Um, others, and, and the one we'll be working with, value work. Um, so a value could be the idea that working is something that adults should do and something that people should be proud of. Um, this isn't something that is necessarily true from culture to culture that people go out and have a career and find meaning in those careers, um, but that is certainly a value that many Americans hold. Beliefs are a little bit different. Beliefs are applying values within the context of the real world, and that context may change, um, and they may be based on assumptions. There's not necessarily facts, although those can play into uh, beliefs as well. So if you value work, then one belief you might have might be that all adults who want to work uh, can find work if they try hard enough. So this may change. Maybe you go through a rough patch and are not able to find work, and your belief about people being able to find work if they truly want it, may change. That doesn't necessarily change the underlying value. Usually the value stays intact and the beliefs change. Finally, we have ideology. And ideology is a cluster of these beliefs on a variety of topics. And usually political ideology responds to questions of governmental authority, property ownership, and uh, money. Uh, so Really, it's a question of where government fits into our individual and collective values and beliefs. So following the same example of work, um, an example of ideology might be, since work is a common value, uh, we believe that all adults who want to work can find it. Uh, if they try hard enough, government should not provide long-term unemployment assistance. So ideology might talk about some of the consequences of your values and beliefs, that long-term unemployment assistance is unnecessary, that food stamps should be limited to people who are trying to find work, um, and that cash assistance should only be in the rarest of circumstances. So that's an ideology. It's a cluster of beliefs, and you can think of it as a cluster of policy uh, choices as well. So ideology and politics usually centers on uh, some very specific questions. 
first is the origination of power. And this question is really where does power come from in a country? And we're going to see that in our readings this week, that the origination of power is a fundamental question of governmental authority. So monarchy, in a monarchy rather, uh, it is believed that power comes from God and is handed down through uh, humans until you get to the king. And in England, that's why many kings made great attempts to link themselves to kings going all the way back to Adam to show that they had legitimacy uh, in holding their power. In a democracy or in a country with democratic values, um, there is a belief that power comes from the people and that the people hold the power and give it to government. Other uh, governmental structures also believe in this, but in, in varying ways. So democracy believes in popular decision-making. A republic believes that you hand over power to representatives who then make decisions. Um, so the origination of power uh, is an important question. And then the role of government in our everyday lives. What power should government have over these uh, things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis? So whether government should be limited in its ability to tax and spend or more powerful um, and more proactive in that way depends on your ideology. So the role of government is a very important question for how ideology plays uh, into this general concept of uh, government. One other important facet of American ideology is American exceptionalism. Um, and American exceptionalism is this idea that America is somehow unique from other countries, um, either in its origin, how it began, or in its current practice. Um, American exceptionalism is often used to say uh, that America is better than other countries, not just different from, but better than other countries, and that it is um, a, uh, as one president put it, a shining beacon on a hill. Um, American exceptionalism has deep roots in our political culture, and it started fairly early. Um, so it's important because it's, uh, for us, because it's, it's important to understand political discourse. And that starts with the shape our institutions took early on and what they look like today. Um, it also influences the way that individual citizens view the world around them. Uh, so it changes the tenor and sometimes the impact of policy as well. And it limits policy options if we believe that they are beneath us. Um, in some way, shape, or form. We don't necessarily accept policies that are too European or too Asian because we believe we are exceptional and different. So there is something to be said about America being different. Um, and that uh, is something that uh, de Tocqueville pointed out uh, early on. And he said that this difference in America stemmed from the fact that everyone chose to be here um, and leave their home countries. Now, that ignores a significant swath of people who did not choose to be here. It also ignores the fact that the people native to the land did not choose for people to come here, nor did they necessarily participate uh, in this uh, founding of the government moving forward. Um, but others have talked about how uh, this makes us different in terms of our history, that our history has changed Americans, uh, America's future, that there's some path dependence because of how we started. Uh, and we'll talk about one of those arguments in a little bit. So there's two big strains of ideology that we need to confront um, they are not the only strains of ideology in America, and they are not um, necessarily ones that everyone holds dear, but they are important in understanding our revolution and our founding and certainly how our institutions are set up. The first of which is the most powerful uh, ideological force in American history, which is classical liberalism. Uh, classical liberalism, not to be confused with modern liberalism, is the idea that uh, first society is the product of individuals. So 
the core of society as individuals. And the highest good is attaining individual liberties for those individuals. So that government is not something that is proactive, but is reactive to the faults within humans. Uh, it is, in other words, a means to an end. And so uh, it stresses individual freedoms or liberties um, and the right to own and uh, dispose of property over civic participation so that it is patriotic to own property it is patriotic to cultivate property and that that is the highest order the major philosopher is one of our readings this week uh john locke which we will talk about in a in a minute now this is not the only ideology and it wasn't the only ideology around the time of our revolution or of our founding uh, republicanism has existed since uh, ancient Greece, and it's the idea that society is a product of people coming together and giving up some freedom to live in relative peace and engage in civic duties. So what that means is that citizens in a republic will do multiple things. One is that they will remain engaged as individual citizens, and sometimes that means giving up freedom to do certain things, uh, but in turn you get uh, civic, um, or excuse me, civil uh, rights. But it also means that we choose representatives who then elevate the discussion above us. Um, so there have been several reiterations of this. Ancient republicanism can be seen in Plato and Aristotle. In the Enlightenment, we have Rousseau writing about republicanism. And then in our own founding, uh, and, and right after the revolution, we have Madison and these rebuttals of and uh, defenses of the Constitution that we'll talk about. So John Locke uh, should sound familiar because John Locke essentially wrote uh, our Declaration of Independence and Thomas Jefferson changed a few things and signed uh, his name to it as did many others. Underlying John Locke and our particular reading is this idea that life, liberty, and property are the sole purposes for the existence of government. Now, our Declaration of Independence says life, liberty, and happiness, um, but Locke says life, liberty, and property. And in fact, we've adhered to Locke's life, liberty, and property in many ways. Much of our legal system and our rights in this country are set up so that the ownership of property is held in very high esteem. So there are three key things to remember about Locke, some of which are in your reading. Um, one overall is that Locke was a social contract theorist, and he believed that government needed the consent of the governed, that people that are individual citizens need to give their consent in order for there to be a legitimate government. Um, it used to be prior to this that you just needed some uh, divine intervention. And so, like I said, kings would trace themselves back to Adam. And in fact, Locke points out uh, how foolish of an errand this is. Two, and this is really key into our reading here, Locke stressed the role of property and liberty in terms of government uh, and good government. So the highest priority of government was securing the rights of citizens to own and cultivate property. Uh, so government is a necessary evil. It should be limited and it should only do what the people tell it to do. And the ultimate goal was to protect property because people could not uh, protect it themselves. In uh, Locke's state of nature, we would have skirmishes over property, and there would be no arbiter of um, kind of neutrality. And so government provides this and provides us with some basic rules so that we can live happily and enjoy our property. Um, and that brings us to our third point. Locke's ideas were revolutionary and quite treasonous at the time he wrote them. So first, he's saying that the king is not given power by God, uh, that man without government would be okay except for some skirmishes over property, and that government was a necessary evil, uh, and that individual rights and the people who worked the land and their rights were the ultimate goal. 
So think about that. In feudal England, you have someone telling the king, you have no right to this land, you have no right to this government, the people who work the land, uh, as you read in our passage, should be the ones who uh, have the right to say what's done with it and to own it, and that property ownership does not mean necessarily setting your name on something, but actually doing something with the land. So it's no surprise that John Locke was chased out of England uh, because of his beliefs and his writings. Now, I didn't assign the hearts reading uh, that I usually assign to my uh, 120 students, but I think it's important to understand Locke in the concept of American uh, government. Locke wrote uh, about government in particular in England. This is not something that was written for the United States. In fact, the places where Locke wrote about the United States uh, really didn't seem to apply to many of his concepts. Uh, he saw it as a rather brutal and um, uncivilized place, um, but a place where people could kind of grab land as they saw fit. So we have to put Locke into context. And that helps uh, move on to this idea of a liberal tradition in America that Hartz puts forth. And his key idea is that American liberalism is different from liberalism elsewhere. We don't truly believe the same things that Locke said because we don't have the same history that Locke was writing uh, about. So unlike countries like England and France who had a feudal tradition, Feudal meaning the king would allow lords and barons to own the land. Ultimately, the king owned all of the land, but lords and barons had portions of it, and then that was divided up. And ultimately, at the bottom, the people who worked the land had no uh, ownership rights to the land and were actually tied to the land. Uh, so without a true feudal tradition, Hartz argues that American liberalism is actually a perversion of Locke. So we adhere to Locke, but Locke changes because we didn't have a feudal system. So Locke was advocating, really, a revolution, an overthrow of the feudal system. Well, we didn't have that here. We didn't have feudalism here. And so without a feudal system to overthrow, liberalism, or Lockeanism, as Hart says, becomes the norm. And so we've actually changed Locke and what he says to fit our own needs. And that matters because a belief in the protection of property and individual rights becomes patriotism rather than a revolutionary idea. So it becomes the norm rather than a challenge. Um, and that means that Locke's ideas were adopted in a way that they might not have been intended. So liberalism provides us with a guidepost, but we really have to understand it in terms of its place in history and its place ge geographically um, and how that differed from us. So republicanism is this idea that we should give up power to representatives who then represent us in government and our interests. There are a, a few key elements uh, of republicanism. One is that we are all uh, virtuous citizens. We stay informed um, and that citizens can and should be dedicated to the public good over private affairs. This was echoed recently in President Obama's farewell address when he said that he is returning to the most important role an American can have, which is that of citizen. It's a very republican idea. Uh, small r, of course, because this is associated with an ideology and not a political party. The other is that there will be an enlightened statesman. And an enlightened statesman is an ideal government actor who is detached from his own personal values and status and does what is right for the country at any given point in time, even if, and especially if, it interferes with his personal wealth uh, or property ownership. Uh, common features exist between different Republican theorists, although people think of it differently. There's usually a distrust of executive figures um, and a preference to giving power to legislatures rather than to a president or a monarch. 
Um, there's a concern that economic inequality destabilizes a republic so that if people have vastly different fortunes, they cannot possibly engage in the same governmental enterprise. Um, and that uh, government is best when the area governed is small. And that when the people can go back to their normal day-to-day -day lives after governing, so Jefferson's yeoman farmer who, uh, you know, plants the seeds, sows his uh, farm, and then can govern and come back to his farm is something that is held up as an ideal in many situations. Um, so republicanism has been said to be dead, that liberalism has kind of ruled the day that the protection of property and individual rights is the American norm, um, but we have used it uh, in our political ideology both uh, in terms of policy but in terms of shaping institutions. So we generally distrust, although it has continued to happen, the uh, growth of executive power. Uh, sometimes we only vocally distrust it. We don't really do anything about it. Uh, but we generally don't like it when the president or the executive branch has more power than it was granted in the Constitution. Uh, there are several pushes for things like term limits uh, that would put a limitation on governmental actors in, in their roles. And uh, perhaps small business owners have taken the place of Jefferson's yeoman farmer, that small business owners are the ones with the true knowledge of the country and their wisdom should be taken uh, into account. So republicanism isn't dead, uh, but it might not be as dominant as liberalism. It would be remiss if we didn't add in some other voices, especially as we talk about how institutions develop and are challenged. Um, the Civil Rights Movement and now the Black Lives Matter Movement um, have tended to use uh, notes of republicanism and liberalism in order to uh, justify their movements. Feminism has done the same thing. There's liberal feminism and then there's more radical feminism that tends to... Uh, uh, go outside of that. And the LGBT movement has often established itself uh, as part of these traditions as well. And, and you can think about that with same-sex marriage or marriage equality, um, that the right to marriage is seen as a fundamental right in society and that the exclusion from a fundamental right um, is a violation of our principles as a nation. Well, what principles would those be if not... Uh, the principles of liberalism and individual rights, but also republicanism and the idea that we give up certain freedoms to get certain things back. That brings us to the readings this week, and I want to start with Federalist 10 and Federalist 51. If you have ever taken my version of American government, um, most certainly, but almost any version of an American government intro class, you have probably read and talked about Federalist 10 and 51. They are um, probably the most important Federalist papers. And as a reminder of what the Federalist papers are, they are defenses of the Constitution um, when it came time to ratify it. So the people writing the Federalist papers, um, James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and John Jay, were writing sequenced and um, very methodical op-eds to papers in order to sway the vote on ratification. So we're going to talk about Federalist 10 and Federalist 51. In Federalist 10, Madison laid out the problem with factions. Um, and factions, he says, are inherent in self-governing systems, but we need to know how to deal with them. And uh, he said there are three potential problems that may result from factions. The first is an unstable government, and given that they just fought a revolution, this was a pretty big fear on behalf of the citizenry. Uh, the second potential problem is that the public good is disregarded because of the fighting parties. In other words, when people are broken up into factions, they're going to ignore the work that needs to get done for the general population. And then three, when factions occur, um, decisions are usually made by an overbearing majority that does not decide things in the common good. 
So what becomes important is what Madison is calling a faction. A lot of people will say, well, Madison was talking about political parties. There's a potential that he meant that, but he was being fairly specific in the difference between an organized group and a faction. So a faction is a number of people who are united by some common impulse. Some common impulse. So there's not just the idea that they're organized around an idea, but the impulse suggests that there's a temporal matter, that this is um, a temporary um, blip in the radar, but people get together based on it and kind of um, overcome the common good. Um, and so what he's trying to say here is that factions kill a country, and a pure democracy, which is what many anti-federalists were calling for, um, or at least limited republics, could not handle the dangers of factions in any organized way. So then Madison discusses the causes of faction, and as we'll see from here on out with Federalist 10, there's two of everything. So he says there's two causes of faction. The first is man's zeal for differences in opinion and allegiance to various leaders. In other words, we don't agree on things, and in fact, we like to disagree on things. Um, and the second reason, um, which he says is the most common, is inequality in distribution of wealth. Now, this is where Madison, for a brief second, sounds a little bit like a Marxist, but he actually says, you know, people's differences in wealth and in, in ability to obtain wealth and pay for things necessary for life, um, that usually leads to a lot of differences and a lot of strife. Um, he doesn't suggest that everybody be given everything equally or anything like that. He just merely points out that inequality causes factions. So having given the causes, Madison offers um, two potential cures. The first is that we can try and remove the causes. And he says there's two ways to do that. The first is to destroy liberty. Um, in other words, he says if we take away freedom, people won't have the freedom to get together and therefore factions are taken care of. But he says, obviously, this is not desired. He likens it to eliminating air to prevent a fire, or eliminating oxygen to prevent a fire. Um, he says, it'll work, but it defeats the purpose of trying to control for factions in the first place. The second way to remove the causes is to try and make everyone think alike. And he says, you can probably do this for a short period of time, but over the long term, you certainly cannot do this. So... This is the point at which he says, you know, people say, well, an enlightened statesman will help us if we just put someone in charge, like George Washington, who is neutral and fair and good, and um, that can answer for all of us and answer to all of us. But he says, these people are in short supply and cannot be counted on to do the right thing all the time. So he says, we can't remove the causes. So he moves on to his second type of cure. And his second type of cure for the ills of factions is to control the effects. He says faction is so ingrained in human nature that you cannot remove it. You can only work to control it. So depending on what type of faction it is, you have a different response. If the faction is a minority, meaning it's a minority of the population, um, popular a uh, popular vote or popular will will defeat it. Case closed, pretty simple. But, and this is the faction that Madison is most concerned with, if it's a faction of the majority, that can become really problematic, and you can actually take away rights from minorities just because the majority agrees to do so. Um, and he's pretty fearful of this happening. So he says you can control the effects of factions in two ways. One is by having a large number of citizens and representatives. That means instead of just having, um, you know, one or two or three or four different kinds of views, you have 10 or 12 or 20 different kinds of views on any particular topic. And then you have representatives to refine them um, and act more deliberately in front of the government. And then the second way is that you extend the country over a large territory. This prevents people from getting together in groups or mobs and enacting mob justice and really empowers the representatives to carefully think over their actions given um, what their constituents want and what is good for the nation. So 
having a large number of citizens and representatives and extending the country over a large territory. Those are the ways uh, to control a majority faction. And he says the only way in which we can do this is through the Constitution. So in other words, Madison sets up factions as a key problem and says the Constitution is the only way to solve it. So that's Federalist 10. Federalist 51 should sound fairly familiar to you because it's a defense of the Constitution based on the notion of checks and balances. Um, in this essay, Madison is writing on the um, virtues of a Republican government over other forms of government, um, over, or, or rather, the virtues of having representatives um, and representatives that make deliberative decisions um, based on what is both good for the entire nation and the will of their constituents. Um, he outlines how this is going to work, and he says each branch within the government should have two things. One, a will all its own, meaning certain things that are up to it and it only. And two, as little to do with electing or selecting members of the other branches as possible, because this allows for each branch to be somewhat independent. Now, there is overlap, as we'll talk about throughout the semester, in terms of selection and oversight, but he says that these are necessary to provide checks and balances, not counter to them. Um, in this um, Federalist paper, we have one of Madison's most famous quotes in that um, if all men um, were angels, no government would be necessary. But all men are not angels. Men will always be ambitious, and we have to counter ambition with ambition. In other words, you counter the ambition of political men by putting other ambitious political men in front of them. Um, and Madison is generally talking about humans, but at the time it was just men, but this is of women as well. Um, in addition, each branch must have a defense against the others so that you avoid overreach. Um, Congress has the built-in defense of being the strongest branch and can move quite freely without the power of the others. The executive, he says, is the weakest and needs something more, like the veto power. Um, and the judicial branch has lifetime appointments um, to remove them from political will. So there are two things about America's form of government that work particularly well, according to Madison. Um, and here he's saying not just America's form of government, but what they're proposing for the Constitution. The first is dual federalism, or the notion that not just one government exists, but two, meaning the federal government and the states, um, into separate but equal parts. And he says that this provides for the kinds of um, dual layer of checks and balances outside of just the checks and balances between the branches. And then the second thing he says is that a large and diverse society is important because you cannot gather together to form factions and take over the government. So this goes back to the point of we are really afraid that we're going to descend into chaos now that we have our own country. How do we control for that? Well, if we have a large territory and this constitution allows for that, that that's less likely to happen. So that brings us then to the counter argument, of course, which is found in Brutus and Anti-Federalist 17. And I'm going to start with Brutus 1 because it provides a very good overview of the Anti-Federalist rhetoric. Um, the problems for Brutus with the proposed Constitution um, were that this was going to be a country um, the size of which had never been seen to be sustained by this type of document before in history. Um, so it's size, it's the scope of the document, meaning how much the government is allowed to do on the federal level. It's the diversity of the country that the document is going to cover, that there are too many differences um, state by state um, for any one document to govern the, govern the entire thing. And the biggest argument, and probably the biggest fear, was that Never before in history had anything like this worked. Anytime you had a republic, like Rome, like Greece, it descended into tyranny and fell off the face of the earth eventually. So Brutus is saying, listen, we can try this, but what we're going to end up with is a problem like we just tried to solve with the King of England and had to fight a revolution for. Um, so Brutus was not keen on the Constitution, 
and laid out kind of the overall argument for the Anti-Federalists moving forward. One thing to note is that the Anti-Federalists, unlike the Federalists, were not as organized and methodical in how they released their messages. So the Anti-Federalists weren't, you know, releasing a sequence of op-eds to kind of counteract whatever was going on in the public at any given point in time, we've only gathered them later in history to kind of account for the breadth of argumentation and put them in a book and all of that type of thing. Um, but they were speeches, they were pamphlets, they were op-eds, they were all kinds of things um, from all kinds of people. So there's not the same kind of coherent message from one author to the next. So in Anti-Federalist 17, what we're talking about is not just why the Constitution as proposed is bad, although that's certainly the underlying sentiment, but really the subversion of state authority. And Brutus mentions this too, but Anti-Federalist 17 kind of gets into it a little more in depth. And that really is the crux of the Anti-Federalist argument, that states are better equipped to handle the needs of citizens um, and without breaking um, and causing chaos. And this constitution ultimately subverts state authority. And as much as the founders who wrote the constitution tried to say that it didn't, it did in many ways. And, and that, that was kind of their perception of the problem of the Articles of Confederation is that it gave the states too much power and too much power spread out amongst the states meant there, there were constant problems and squabbles and insurrections. But Anti-Federalist 17 points out that there is a problem here because the link between the people and the federal government, um, the Constitution is, a settle, is essentially bypassing the states. Instead of the states putting together the federal government as entities of the federal government, the people empower the federal government. And so if the people empower the federal government, there is nothing requiring the federal government to make way for the states in any potential conflict, because they can always claim that the, the people have empowered them. And in fact, we have Supreme Court decisions that, um, as recently as this past year, have mentioned that fact, that um, the power of the federal government is derived from the people and not from the states, and therefore the, there is a different calculation to be made when there is a conflict between the, gov the federal government and state governments. Um, and another problem that you know was mentioned here is that Congress really gets all the good stuff. You're talking about minting and coining money. You're talking about declaring war. You're talking about a superstructure over the states that is bigger than the states. Congress really gets anything that is worth regulating, which really puts the states out of business with um, respect to a lot of things. And then there was mentioned the problem of the courts, that the federal courts would essentially make the state courts obsolete. And of all the things within this anti-federalist paper, that's probably the one that has least uh, been effectuated. Um, if anyone has had experience with courts, it's most likely the state court system. We touch them in a variety of ways, marriage, death, um, divorce, birth, etc. Those are all state court matters. Um, traffic tickets, um, crimes of most varieties are state court matters. So on the one hand, we are much more likely to have experience with and to be involved with the state court system. That said, there is an argument to be made that the federal court system has a lot of power to invalidate the actions of states um, based on the Constitution, and that is in fact true. So the arguments are, you know, this is going to happen, and some of them have happened, um, but the question is whether that's a bad thing or necessary um, this day and age. So we see this same tension between Federalists and Anti-Federalists reflected today. Role of the government, economics, social problems and changes, and what should government do, right? And the role of the courts in particular, should they, you know, merely interpret what's in front of them and what that means? What does judicial review mean? Um, and then we see this in different state policies. We have states that are now allowing for the recreational use of marijuana and other states that still fully criminalize it um, with strong penalties. What does that mean when you have those two states right next to each other 
um, with such different policies. In fact, we have a couple of states suing Colorado right now because of um, this particular issue. Um, protection of property is still a value that we hold dear, um, and we have embedded it in many ways in our policy lives, um, like the value of owning a home. Um, it actually, if we were to take away the policies that incentivized home ownership, might not be a wise economic choice to own a home. It might be smarter to rent, but because we have decided that home ownership is so important, and this can be traced all the way back to Locke, um, we have decided to make those policies um, occur. For example, anytime we talk about getting rid of the mortgage um, interest deduction, people lose their minds. Um, so this is something that is deeply embedded in the American psyche and has a lot to do with how each branch functions. And then, of course, the notion of American exceptionalism. We still believe that America is exceptional, and we still take issue with implementing things that we believe are from other nations' um, histories and precedents rather than our own. Um, so we see this debate rage on, and it will rage on as long as there is a United States of America, because this is the fundamental tension underlining every issue um, we face today. So with that, that's why it's important. Um, as I said at the beginning, why is it important to even talk about ideology? This is why, because ideology undergirds everything we talk about with the institutions.